Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for today. I thank you for today, for this word uh, that God, that you have um, prepared. And Lord, I pray that we come spiritually hungry. That we come seeking the gospel. We come seeking the good news of Jesus Christ, that sinners are made righteous before God. That, God, you made the way, and we thank you. And, God, you are awesome because of it. So we come praising you today. So send your spirit here, God, to guide and direct us, to open our hearts to the truth, to challenge us, to sanctify us. God, to call sinners to repentance. Let the gospel message go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, and we'll be in verses 7 through 13. To the church in Philadelphia. This is Christ, our Lord, speaking. He says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will ride on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God in the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Now, as we've been looking at the church churches in Revelation They have given us examples of what churches look like throughout history, have they not? Uh, Two weeks ago, for example, we were looking at the church of Sardis. And Sardis, um, as we saw, they had the look, they had the walk, they had the talk, they had the reputation of being Christians, yet They were deceiving themselves because when Christ comes and he looks at this church, he says to them, what? You think you're alive, but you're dead. And so he declared that they were dead because Jesus, being the shepherd of the church, looked upon them and saw them and he looked to the heart and he says, you say you know me, but you do not. And so We saw how the promises that were given to Sardis said, if you do not repent, I will close your door. I will shut you down. And we saw how more churches are actually closing their doors today than actually opening. And the statistics were astronomical. But today, today, we get to see a church that got it right that there was no condemnation, there was no warning, that Christ looked at their works and he says, behold, I see your works. And then he goes on to give them promises after promises of what a faithful church looks like and what will be given to them. In fact, looking at these churches, only two out of seven actually got it right. Only two, Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia which is kind of amazing when you look at the city of Philadelphia, which is the brotherly love here, uh, as King Atlas had kind of his brotherly love towards his brother. It was kind of named after him, uh, which is kind of weird, you know. But other than that, it was a city that had a mission. 
It was a city that looked to spread the, the Greek culture throughout the world because of its location. So they were on mission to spread Greek culture. And in the midst of this is the church of Philadelphia. And so when we look at these churches, it's actually more common to see an ungodly church than it is to see a godly church. So the question to you that I'm posing to you today is what makes a church faithful and steadfast before our King Jesus? What is required of God for a church to have no condemnation? Oh, could you imagine the reward? Could you imagine that, well done, my good and faithful servant? What's required? Because I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had with people that they're looking for the perfect church. Oh, you know, if we could just have a church that played better music, oh, man, that would make it a perfect church. I can't tell you how many times I mess up on the drums. Y'all probably don't even know. I do. <laughs> <laughs> or, oh, if the church just had a youth facility, man, it would be the perfect church. You see, what I'm getting at, and I think you'll understand, is when we start looking at a church, we start qualifying it as the perfect church because it fits our needs. But is that what makes it a perfect church? Is that what Jesus says that when he looks upon a church and he doesn't condemn a church? It's like, oh, you, you built a youth facility. Good job. What makes it a steadfast and faithful church? I'm going to give you the quick answer. It's a church who sees Jesus, knows they need Jesus, and keeps Jesus' word. It's all about the gospel. And so today, as we dive in, we see point number one is a faithful and steadfast church is a church who knows Christ. And knows who Christ is after all these, uh, to all these churches, he gives a title that kind of then goes along with what he's saying to them. And we see this in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. You see, when we are looking for a church, it doesn't begin with, what can the church do for me? That, is, that does not make it a, a healthy, godly church. It doesn't begin with, do I find this church entertaining or not? It begins with a church that knows who Jesus is. That's what makes a faithful church. And why is this so important? Because at the heart of this message, at the heart of that statement, that it knows who Jesus is, we find the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, at the heart of a church, it has to be centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a gospel-centered question. This is the gospel is at the foundation of the church. And the gospel is looking to the good news of Jesus and knows who he is. That sinful men have been stained and blemished by sin. That they are found condemned in their sin. But yet, but yet, can have a relationship with God. Oh, that's the good news. That you can be counted holy and righteous before God. Because of Jesus Christ and his holiness. See, that's at the heart of what it is to have a faithful and steadfast church. Is it knows who Christ is. That he is the Holy One. And in order for us to really understand what it means to be the Holy One, this is such kind of an Old Testament uh, term. It's used multiple times, multiple times. I just gave you three examples here. In Job 6.10, when Job is confronting those who are trying to comfort him and they're trying to accuse him that he did something wrong, and it's kind of the word of faith, like, you know, you gotta, 
you ultimately, this has happened to you because you have sinned. You've lost your family, your houses, your land, your, your livestock, and now you're dirt poor and in poverty. What does Job respond? In all of his suffering, Job 6.10 says, This would be my comfort. I would even exult in pain unsparing, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. He's taking comfort in all of his agony, all of his suffering, because he has not denied the Holy One of God. Psalm 71, 22, he says, I will also praise your name with the heart for your faithfulness. Oh my God, I will sing praises to you with a lyre. Oh, Holy One of Israel. He's looking to the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 6, 3 accumulates God and his holiness, showing that the Holy One is God when he says in a, in a triple response, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So in the Old Testament, it's always the Holy One is associated with God. Then in the New Testament, we see that the demons even declare that Jesus is the Holy One. In Mark 1, 24, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus, is, the demons declare Jesus as the Holy One. That His disciples, Jesus' disciples declare Jesus to be the Holy One. When, when Jesus had fed the 5,000, and then he starts giving them this crazy message, you have to eat my flesh, you have to drink my blood pointing to himself as God and that you're going to be made righteous before God because you trust in Jesus. And they're like, whoa, that's a crazy statement. We just wanted food. We just wanted bread. We just wanted what Jesus, what you could give to us. We just wanted you to fit our need. But what does Jesus' disciples declare? He says, who am I? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that what? You are the Holy One of God. You are God in the flesh. You are the one who gives eternal life because you are holy. You are God in the flesh. And now we come to Revelation and Jesus declares himself to be the Holy One of God who has come in the flesh, who was separated completely from sin. See, that's what it means to be holy, is to be separated from sin, to be unblemished in God's eyes, to be completely dedicated to God without fail. See, this is the message of the gospel that we are not holy, but we are made holy through Christ's holiness. That's the gospel. And as a church, why does this matter? Here it is. Because as a church, we are called to be holy as God is holy. 1 Peter 1, 15-16 but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We as a church, like the church in Philadelphia, we're not perfect. See, they weren't perfect. What do you mean by that? He, there's no condemnation. Because they were still sinners, but yet they didn't look to themselves for their own holiness. They looked to Christ. They kept their eyes focused on Christ. And they were steadfast to Christ. You see, we still battle sin, but we have to keep our eyes focused on Christ. And when we do sin, like John says in 1 John and like James says, we are to repent and we're to look to Christ. You see, they understood that Christ was holy, and he was the true one. He is the only way to eternal salvation. That is the truth. 
my friends, that Christ is the only way. He is the true one. He, it means aletheinos uh, means that he is genuine, authentic, and real, as opposed to someone who is false, corrupt, or has error. He is perfect, genuine, real. Why is he saying this? Because during that time, he's opposing himself to the synagogue of Satan here, who lies. You see, the Jews were the ones who were confronting confronting the Christians and saying, no, your righteousness is not found in Christ. He's not the way. Your works is what makes you right before God. If you would just follow these commandments, you will be right before God. That's the message of Satan. You understand that? Satan's lie says God doesn't even know or understand how righteous you are before him. You can be made right. You can be right before God. That's Satan's lie. You see, Christ is the true one. He says in John 14, 6, he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's opposing the lie of a works righteousness. You cannot just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and say, I think I'm a good person. But how many people actually do that? You, you confront them and say, hey, do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with him? Well, yeah. But come to church. Oh, whoa. Huh. Whoa. Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't need church. Well, you said you know Jesus. Yeah, but I'm, I'm good. We got a good relationship. You see, at the heart of that lie is they think they are right in their own eyes. It's the message of Satan. Jesus says, I am the way. There is no other. He's the true one. He is the truth that he is the only way to eternal life. That no one comes to the Father. You do not come to the Father by your own righteousness. When God looks at you and he sees your righteousness, it does not measure up to his. So you will not be granted eternal life. Oh, you'll be granted something though. Eternity in hell. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. Why? Because he has the key of David. He gives another title. What does this mean? You see, in Revelation 1.18, Jesus says he has the key to death and hell because he conquered it at the cross. And now what he's saying here is that he has the key of David, meaning he has the key to salvation. He is holy, he's the true one, and he has the key to salvation. You see, a faithful and steadfast church is a church who knows, who holds the keys to salvation and eternal life and who holds the keys to condemnation and hell. And he will lock the door forever. You see, what he's saying here is that David represented the Messianic office. And whoever has the key has the authority. And this is quoted from Isaiah 22, 22. When Isaiah is kind of looking ahead to Christ. And he's talking about David's servant, the Elo, uh, Elohim. He says in Isaiah 22, 22, And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. And he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. See, he's quoting scripture, referencing himself. And like the servant David, whoever has the key to David's house controls who comes in and out of David's house. It's given as a messianic term. And what he decrees, he says, he who opens and none will shut and who shuts and no, no one opens. What he could, decrees cannot be undone. Why? Because he is the king. 
So this could mean, I think, one of two things. It could mean a couple, uh, that if Christ opens the door to you, to the kingdom, no one's ever going to take that away. No one's ever going to shut the door on you. And secondly, this could also mean that Christ can open and close doors of evangelism. Because we see this in verse 8. When we come to our second point, a faithful and steadfast church is a church who keeps Christ's word. He says in Revelation 3.8, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. He says, I know your works. You see, when we look at this church, we see that Christ saw their works. He's all-knowing. He sees our works. He saw their deeds, and he found no condemnation because they were keeping his word. What a great compliment that any church should strive for, that any church should receive is that he didn't condemn them like Sardis who when he looked at their works having a reputation of being alive he found them dead he didn't condemn the church of Philadelphia like the church of Thyatira. The- uh, he acknowledged that after they had love and faith and service and patient endurance they were tolerating the woman Jezebel he did not condemn this church like the false teachers at Pergamum. And he did not condemn them by having lost their love like the church at Ephesus. But he commends them for their faithfulness and perseverance and steadfastness that they kept his word. And what does that mean? They did not deny him before others. You see, that is what a faithful church looks like. It keeps his word It observes his commandments. Even more than that, their life was being conformed to a greater image of Christ because they kept keeping his word. You see, as we keep Christ's word, it shows our love for Christ. John 14, 23 through 24 says, Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, hear that? If anyone loves me, He will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. So Jesus is saying here to the church of Philadelphia, you love me because I see your works. You see, when I was in chiropractic school, as a, it's another profession of mine that I, I work as a chiropractor. I have to admit, as I was learning to adjust somebody, I was scared to death. You know, it's kind of the idea. Um, you see the, I'm sure you see the YouTube videos of someone popping someone's neck. You know, you just say, oh my gosh. Uh, and I'll never forget the first time I adjusted someone's neck. I... Uh, I was standing behind him, I adjusted him, and, and I'm like, it popped. I'm like, oh my gosh, I just killed somebody. I mean, y'all, we all grew up watching the Chuck Norris videos, right? So immediately, I start sweating because, you know, this was in a club, you know, and you're just like, oh my gosh, this person has died. So I, I turn around, I'm like, oh my gosh, are you okay? And I'm looking up at him, just staring at him, thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be kicked out of school. But they survived, and so did I. And that was kind of a stepping stone. You know, it kind of created some comfort to me. And the more I practiced, the better I got. You see, we're not going to be perfect. We're still going to struggle with sin. But the more we keep looking to Christ and seeing who he is, and seeing the good news of the gospel, the more we're going to be able to wage war and fight against our sin. And to be able to keep 
like keep on keeping on God's word. And the more we practice it, the more we're going to keep being sanctified. And the, just meaning the more we're going to keep being uh, conformed to the image of Christ. We have to keep looking to Christ. We have to keep practicing keeping God's commandments. Because secondly, Jesus commends this church because they kept his word and they did not deny his name. They did not recuse the name of Christ when they were being pressured by people and were saying that Christ wasn't the way and they, they should deny him. They did not deny Christ. They actually confessed Christ is what this means. When they were pressured by the world and the Greek society, they're saying, oh, you need to transition. You need to follow the Greek ways, the Greek gods. They did not deny Christ. They confessed Christ. They stood firm. They did not deny him. But you, you might think, oh, in order to do this, man, those, those guys must have been super saints, right? I mean, they must have had a cloak and a cap and everything else as super saints. They, they probably had some special gifts, some special knowledge in order to keep Christ's word. But do you see what Jesus says in order to keep his word? He says, I know you had little power. You see, this is not a negative connotation here. This is actually being used as a commendation of their strength. You see, they, we might be as a church be able to relate to this because we're not great in numbers. We're not the mega church out there doing mega things. But we can keep Christ's word and we can keep confessing Christ. You see, they had a powerful impact on this city because even though they were small in size, Spiritual power was flowing through them to transform this church and transform this city and people were being redeemed and lives were being transformed because the gospel was going forth. You see, we might even think that, oh, these people are probably high up in society. But most of the time, that's not the way God works. You see, it's not, a, and even if it is, it's not about who you are in society. We are all spiritually broke. We're all spiritually dead. It's only through Christ that we are made alive. You see, as a church, it's not about the numbers as our goal. It's about keeping Christ's word. It's about being faithful and steadfast. You see, a faithful and steadfast church, thirdly, is also a church that holds to the promises of Christ. That's also what makes them faithful and steadfast, is they hold to the promises of Christ. Revelation 3 8 says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. And I know you have little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You see, Christ is using them to evangelize. Because of their faithfulness, Christ has promised that he has put an open door uh, which no one is able to shut. Now again, this can mean that their salvation was secure and that they were guaranteed into the Messianic kingdom. However, this can also mean that because of the church of Philadelphia's faithfulness, that Christ was opening doors for the proclamation of the gospel. Both can be correct. And both can lean on the promises of God. That's what a faithful church does, does it not? It leans on the promises of God, one for salvation and two to spread the good news of salvation. That's what he means by an open door. You see, we see Paul using the same terminology to go and spread the gospel as an open door in Colossians 4, 2 through 3. As Paul is literally in prison in Rome, he says, continue to the church, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open up to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Even in prison, in prison, 
Paul is still looking for the open door to evangelize the lost. To proclaim the gospel. And in verse 9, we see how God was opening the door for the Christians in Philadelphia to spread the gospel to the Jews. Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Like, the, like in Smyrna, the Jews were highly persecuting the church, and they were suffering. And there was going to be more suffering. So in Smyrna, Christ continued to encourage them. Now in Philadelphia, we know that there was, a, there was hostility from the Jews because Ignatius, an early church father of Antioch, debated with these Jews in Philadelphia. And there was hostility because the Jews thought that they were right with God because they were Jews by letter. But Paul tells us in Romans 2.28, that it's not the circumcision of the flesh that makes you a Jew. It's, the heart, it's, it's of the heart that makes you a true, a true Jew a Jew. And the point I'm trying to make here is that it's really easy sometimes to have the mindset is that when there's hostility and possible persecution and shame, it's really easy for us as a church or as people of Christ, to go, ooh, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to offend somebody. So what do we do? We just, well, we'll just let that person be, and we move on. It's so easy when there's hostility to just not share the gospel. Well, I don't need to give them the gospel or him the gospel. They're mean. They might hate me. That person might show hostility. They might even, oh my goodness, they might even post something on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. But if the door is opened and God has brought them before you, if we are to be a faithful church that holds to the promises of God, then we need to hold to the promise that God can change someone's heart who's even hostile. And that's what he's saying here, that some of these people who think they're right with me, which is a lie, they may be Jews by birth, but they're not Jews spiritually, I'm going to open this door and I'm going to change their heart because my faithful servant had preached the word to them, they kept the word and they confessed it and they didn't deny me, and now I'm going to change their heart. And now they're going to fall down and bow down, showing that they've been conquered. And now they're submitting fully to Christ Jesus as their Lord. He's showing that some of their enemies will be utterly vanquished, humbled, and defeated. And they will now pay homage to those who they thought God has cast out. But he's going to show that he has loved the Gentiles to Israel. However, I want to be clear as we have seen throughout church history that God has saved some Jews throughout church history through Christ. And that there will come a time in the future when Paul says in Romans eleven twenty six 26 that all of Israel will be saved. And we've seen this in multiple places in the Bible. Ezekiel 37, 11 through 14. And I want to give a little background this, in Ezekiel 37, uh, Ezekiel is taken, he's shown a valley of dry bones. And he says, Son of man, prophesy to these dry bones that they will become alive. And so he does, and then their joints are knitted together, there's sinews, there's, there's flesh put on their bodies. And so then he says, what does this mean? In Ezekiel 37, 11 through 14, he says this, then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy. 
and say to them, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. O my people, I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. He then goes on in Ezekiel in the next chapter to discuss how he will put the land back together with the two sticks. In Zechariah 12, 10, we see the same thing. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas of mercy, so that when they look on me, on him who they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So God is telling them that he will save some, but then in, in the future, in the time in the future, that he will pour out on them grace and mercy. So next we see a church who was tested and improved in verse 10 and 11a. He says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. You see, there's another promise to a church that has been faithful and steadfast and has been tested and approved by Jesus Christ. You see, as we looked at these churches, there's been other promises to the seven churches. They have warnings of impending judgment on the sin of their congregations. You see, we see that to the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, 5, that if they do not repent, that he's going to come and remove their lampstand from its place. And this is a warning to the church that if you lose your love of Christ, there is judgment. So all through church history, there is a pending judgment if you learn uh, lose your love of Christ. We also saw to the judgment uh, of Pergamum, the church at Pergamum that were following false teachings. And he told them that if they do not repent, I will come soon and war against them with a sword of his mouth. And this is to a church that starts following false doctrine, that the judgment is that he will war against you. And then in chapter 3, we saw Sardis, that if they didn't wake up and didn't repent and didn't correct the way that they were going, that he was going to come to them like a thief. He will not know the hour that he comes when he talks, but about this, is, we might not know the hour that he comes, but he said that he was going to come and that he would close their door. And we saw how more churches are closing their doors than opening. So now to the church who gets it right, what does he say? He promises he will give a faithful, steadfast church that when he comes, and he judges the earth during Daniel's 70th week or Jacob's trouble or the tribulation that we see in uh, chapter 6 through 19 of Revelation. That he will come and he will save his church from the trial that he's going to bring upon the whole earth by rapturing his church out of this trial. That's what he says. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming up on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. So what trial is he talking about? You see, there's been a lot of discussion and debate about this because a lot of people reference that this is something that happened in 70 AD or something that has just happened to the church in Philadelphia. And I think that is a poor view for several reasons. Number one, because most scholars put the book of Revelation written towards 90 AD, not 70 AD. You see, even Irenaeus, who lived between 130 AD and 202 AD, who had heard the preaching of Polycarp, who was one of John's disciples, dates the book towards the end of the Roman emperor Domitian between 81 and 96 AD. And he says this, for it was seen not long ago, but almost in our generation near the end of uh, domination's reign. 
And there's other early church fathers, Jerome, Eusebius, Irenaeus, even Clement of Alexandria in origin do not use uh, Domination's name, but they reference his work, that he was the emperor. So number one, it's the book of Revelation was written after 70 A.D. So this couldn't reference something that happened in 70 A.D. Number two, he says, because you have kept my word, because this is in the Oris tense, okay, this is something that happened. He says, I will keep you from future active something that will from the I will keep you from the trial this is something I will this is future active and this goes right along with the outline of the book of Revelation you see in Revelation 119 he, uh, Jesus says to John he says write therefore the things that you have seen those that are those that are to take place after uh, What you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. So when is the after this? After this is after the church. He addresses the churches in Revelation 4.1. He says, after this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So what is after this? After... The church age, after he addresses the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And number three, this can't be something that happened to Jerusalem or to only Christians martyred during Nero's reign. This is something that will happen, he says, to the whole earth. Which is exactly what we see with the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. When God pours out his wrath and judgment upon the earth. Because when we look at this, this is a, he says it's a test. And that's exactly what it is. It's a test. It's to show and expose people for what they really are. That's why he says its purpose is to test those who dwell upon the earth. And that word to dwell upon the earth is used constantly in the book of Revelation to mean and to point out unbelievers. Because the believers have been raptured during this time. There's a whole list of, there's, it's used nine times, just one time in Revelation 6.10. It says, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? He's pointing to the unregenerate. These are the people who have been martyred. You see, we look to the judgments of the churches and we apply those. Why can we not apply the promise that God gives here? A faithful, steadfast church applies the promise of Jesus. That's what it does. And he says this promise is that he will keep us from this trial. You see, some believe that the church will actually go through this trial. They will actually go through the seven-year tribulation. But again, I don't think this is correct because he tells us that he will keep us from, okay? And this phrase is tereo ek, keep from. And those who argue that the church will go through the tribulation hold that this phrase means that he's going to preserve them through the tribulation. But again, I don't think that's what he's saying here because just that's not the way that the Greek language is used. If he wanted to say he was going to take us through it, there's other Greek words that dia, tereo dia, that it means through. Or if he's going to put us in the tribulation, he would have said uh, tereo in, which means in the tribulation. But instead he says tereo ek, from the tribulation. You see, John used the same phrase one other time in his gospel, in John 17, 15. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Tereo ek, from. What he's saying here is that spiritually speaking, 
Whoever God gives to the Son, the Son will preserve, and no one will take them from His hands. He's not talking about physically here. He's talking about spiritually. But then the same writer, John, then now applies this same language that he's now going to keep you from the trial that's going to come upon the whole earth physically. He's using it both ways. It's spiritually here in John 17, 15, but now he's using it. He's going to keep us from the hour of trial. That we would be with him. So a faithful and steadfast church is a church who holds to the promises of God. And two other quick things here. A faithful and steadfast church is a church who follows Christ's commands. He says, I'm coming soon. This is imminent. This is imminent. He says, I'm coming soon. So what should we do? Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. That you are to persevere. Why should we fight sin? Why should we make war with our sin? Because our desire is to be holy as our Lord is holy. You see, in that holiness, and as we conduct our lives in holiness, you need to understand you're going to be rewarded. As you follow Christ's commands, you will be rewarded for your faithfulness in this life. So we have to live with the reality of heaven in the future. We must live as heaven as our priority, as heaven as our destination. It has to be our daily mission so we keep the pursuits of this life in the right perspective. The 19th century uh, pastor, Adoniram Johnson, said it best, is that we have to hold fast. He says, a few days in our work will be done. And when it's done, it's done to all eternity. A life once spent is irrevocable. Let us then each morning resolve to send the day into eternity in such a garb as we shall wish it to wear it forever. And at night, let us reflect that one more day is irrevocably gone. You see, we have to hold fast because Christ could come at any moment and each day is irrevocably gone. It's in the book of eternity. So how are you living your life? Are you conducting yourself in holiness? Are you keeping Christ's commands so that no one may seize your crown? Literally, once you receive, once you stay steadfast, James says, you will receive the crown of life. We have to hold fast. We have to keep keeping God's commands to show that we love Him. We have to stay steadfast. And lastly, a church who lives, a steadfast and faithful church is a church who lives for the blessings of Christ. He says in Revelation 3.12, The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven in my own new name. You see, as we live He tells us, the one who conquers. Do you know that what makes you a conqueror in life? In Revelation, it's used a few times. In uh, Romans 8, Paul uses it towards the end. A conqueror is the one who looks to Christ, who has overcame his sin. He calls you a conqueror. A conqueror is not one who says, I'm just going to go out there and slay the dragons. A conqueror is one who looks to Jesus Christ. In Christ, you are considered a conqueror. And he says, you will be made a pillar in the temple of my God. You see, Philadelphia was built on kind of what they called the burned land. And they had a volcano. It was beautiful, fertile land, but they had massive earthquakes. And so what happened is, is that an earthquake would happen. It would literally crumble the city. And so they understood that when they would be made a pillar in the house of God, that they would be there forever. Nothing would shake it. Nothing would crumble it. 
they would be considered conquerors. And he says, I will write on him the name of his God. You know, there's a lot of times as kids, we kind of grew up and, you know, if someone had your toy over there, you're like, give me my toy. And uh, they're like, they would always respond, well, it doesn't have your name on it, right? I mean, how many times have we heard that argument? Christ is going to write his name and the name of his God on you, stamping you as his if you trust and believe in him. He's going to write the name of the new city, the new Jerusalem, showing that we have eternal citizenship. No one's ever going to scratch your name out of the books. You will have eternal citizenship in heaven. And he's going to write his new name. Now, what does this mean? His name's Jesus. You see, in heaven, when believers see him, John says, they will see him just as he is. And in heaven, when you see him in full, in his full glory, you're going to have a better and greater understanding of who Jesus is. And it's going to take on a new name for him. And you, he will write on you his new name. What greater promise, what greater reward are you looking for on this earth how are you living each your day, each and every day? How are you living your life? Is it to the glory of God? Is it for the glory of God? Are you keeping his commandments? Are you not denying him and confessing him before others? Are you leaning on the promises? You see, we can't be perfect as Christ, but we can be faithful and hold fast to Christ. This is the Christian duty. And it's to remain resolute, holding fast to Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this word. God, I pray that it, that you would sow this seed in our hearts and that God, we would be a faithful and steadfast church looking to Christ, holding fast to the gospel of Jesus, keeping your word, confessing your name, holding to the promises that you have given us. God, that we may be found faithful in your eyes. God, forgive us of our sin. Let us hold fast to Christ and his righteousness. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.